I really knew anything about it, I was attracted to the idea of philosophy. I thought of it as a practical subject that could make a real difference, that might have wise things to say about everyday worries, like being rejected in love or failing in a job or not having any friends. Philosophy promised something that might sound a little naive, but was in fact rather profound. A way to learn to be happy. And as I found out more, I discovered that there were six philosophers I was particularly interested in, because they had the wisest things to say about the areas of life I'd always found rather problematic. The first problem that I came to Rome to try and find an answer for was anger. And you only have to spend a few minutes in the city to realize that anger is a massive problem. Modern life is full of frustration, and most of us don't seem able to respond very philosophically to it. We're prone to losing our tempers. Anger seems as much a part of our lives today as bad driving and traffic jams. So it's interesting to discover that in ancient times, anger was felt to be an even greater problem than it is now. Ancient Romans were, if anything, angrier than modern ones. And we find one ancient philosopher who was particularly concerned with anger and wanted to calm people down. He was born in Cordoba, province of Spain, in 1 AD, and his name was Seneca. Seneca was the most famous and popular philosopher of his day, the author of more than 20 books of practical advice about all aspects of life. He came to Rome as a boy and spent most of his life here becoming influential in politics and a member of the Roman Senate. But that doesn't mean that his life was free from frustration. He was naturally a rather melancholy man who suffered from tuberculosis as a youth and was prone to almost suicidal bouts of depression. And he lived in very dangerous times. His political career coincided with the reign of a series of despotic, violent and unpredictable rulers. Seneca was moving in a world where he literally couldn't know what would happen to him tomorrow. The ground was unstable beneath his feet. In 49 AD, he had to take on, against his will, the most fateful job in the imperial administration, tutor to a 12-year-old boy called Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, the future Emperor Nero. It soon became clear that Nero was a murderous psychopath. Knowing he was in extreme danger, Seneca attempted to withdraw from court. Twice he offered Nero his resignation. Twice the emperor refused, embracing Seneca tightly and saying that he would rather die than harm his beloved tutor. Nothing in Seneca's experience encouraged him to believe such promises. It's by wandering around the rooms here in Nero's underground palace you begin to get a sense of just why Seneca was so worried about anger. Nero was a man who had absolute power. People were brought down to these chambers and the most horrific mass murders went on. He would have Romans thrown to the lions, decapitated, eaten by crocodiles and torn apart alive. Virgins were seized off the streets of Rome, were brought here, murdered. Gladiators who hadn't performed well were disemboweled and thrown to wolves all in these underground chambers. It was because the consequences of anger were so great that Seneca was desperate to assuage them. An angry Roman emperor was not just an unpleasant sight, he was potentially a catastrophic phenomenon. Having seen so much of it at first hand, Seneca thought anger a terrible problem, 
He even devoted a whole book entitled On Anger to the subject, the most hideous and frenzied of all emotions, he called it. But, crucially, he refused to see it as an irrational outburst, something over which we had no control. What kind of things make you really angry? What kind of things make you angry on the road? Oh, pretty much inconsiderate. Inconsiderate driving people who don't... Well, they must have passed their test, otherwise they wouldn't be driving like cars. But I mean, the way they drive doesn't say that they've got any idea about driving in England or driving on any road anywhere, surely. They veer across lanes, they just suddenly have, have no regard for anybody else, just pull up and park, they can't reverse, you know, they can't park. Oh. So what are your favourite favorite insults? If someone's done something really bad on the road, what do you, what do you like to call them? <laughs> With gesticulations. Um, basically just just explode for that moment in time, like just clear me air, yeah. clear me head. Have you ever got out of your car and actually hit someone? I did threaten to hit a geezer. He opened his door to put his seatbelt on. Yeah. And I just crumpled his door, but it cut my finger oh. like that. And I thought, Wayne Allingham is a driver with a delivery company. He finds it difficult to control his temper when he's on the road. He doesn't think there's much he can do about it. Seneca would have disagreed. I he says, oh, I'm going to call the police to see that he's going to hit me. Perfect. Yeah. I rode myself to the hospital, put the needle through. Seneca thought that anger was a philosophical problem, and amenable to treatment by philosophical argument. Anger arose from certain rationally held ideas about the world. Oh, mate, a car. What's it? Sorry, hey. oh. And the problem with these ideas is that they're far too optimistic. Where are you going? Can't you see that? In Seneca's analysis, people get angry because they're too hopeful. Yeah, come on, mate. Do you think you'd describe yourself more as an optimist or as a pessimist? Oh, optimist. Got to be. Optimist, yeah. But anyway, don't you think that being optimistic, you're permanently expecting that other people are going to drive in a better way? You know, other people can't drive. No, no, you it's like, to drive, you can you? go to, for days without an incident, you think everything's getting better the right. next thing, you know? Yeah. You come out and you see someone's done your van, and if it's a little car and they cut, you think, yeah, but take long, your life, long, especially long, when they've got kids right, in the back. Hang on, how long, have you been how long have you been driving a van? A van, two years. I've been driving a van, two years. Every yeah. day, yeah. every day someone cuts you off, someone does something stupid, yeah. right? Yeah. And yet every time, you get surprised and you get angry. In a way, yeah. it's, like, it's, like, it's it? like you're surprised that this thing has happened again. Do you might be a good idea to kind of get more pessimistic about other drivers? Because well, then you, you sort of calm down about their driving. Like if you told yourself, other people just can't yeah, drive. No, Whenever we get angry, there's an element of surprise and a sense of self-pitying and justice. What Seneca would say to Wayne is that traffic jams and bad driving are neither unfair nor surprising. They're a predictable feature of life. The person who gets angry about them simply has the wrong expectations of the world. So Seneca's first piece of advice is to be more pessimistic, to adjust our view of the world so as to be less surprised when reversals occur. And he urges us to bear something else in mind too. If we can accept that there's often nothing we can do about our frustrations, we'll be less likely to lose our rag when we encounter them. Your indicator's on, mate. Your indicator. Seneca believed that one of the reasons we get so angry is because we imagine that things should basically always go our way, that we should be able to make the world conform to our wishes. But actually, we can't. There are many things that we just have to accept. We're often not free to change things. And in order to try and make us understand this, in order to try and bring this image home, Seneca came up with an unusual idea. He said that all of us are essentially rather like dogs tied to the back of a moving chariot. Now, the leash is just about long enough to give us some freedom, but it isn't long enough to allow us to move wherever we want. Now, the dog quickly realises that in order to maximise its chances of happiness, it should at times follow the chariot, or in this case the bicycle if the budget was limited, so it's far better 
essentially to follow in a direction where you don't want to go than to kick against something that you can't change. Because then you'll end up not only going where you don't want to go, but also being strangled. But we do have one advantage over animals. We have reason and dogs don't. And this reason gives us a key advantage. It means that we can realise what we can change and what we can't. We may be unable to alter certain events, but we can always change our attitude towards those events. And it's this ability that Seneca believed gave us our distinctive form of freedom. Come on, Flora, necessity commands you to come this way. Come on, come on. But Seneca isn't just useful for times when we're feeling furious. His philosophy offers us a way to stay calm and collected, whatever life may throw at us. You get a sense of the life Seneca would have led when you wander around the ancient Roman town of Pompeii. He was a rich man, and you might be tempted to imagine that he and his patrician contemporaries enjoyed an easy, untroubled existence. But read Seneca, and you realize how wrong that is. In the midst of luxury, the Roman rich was seething with fury. Seneca came to an interesting analysis of anger from looking at the people around him. He moved in the wealthiest circles in Imperial Rome. Many of his friends had large villas in the countryside. They would have had retinues of slaves to prepare the food. There would have been long banquets lasting into the night. Guests would have been seated on gilded couches. Seneca noticed a surprising thing in the world around him, that being rich tended to make people angrier, not calmer. As he put it, prosperity fosters bad tempers. Seneca knew of a man called Vedius Pollio, a high imperial official who once hosted a party. And he had a slave who was carrying a tray of crystal glasses, and this unfortunate slave happened to trip on a piece of marble and drop the tray of crystal glasses all over the floor. They shattered. And this so angered Vedius Pollio that he ordered the slave to be thrown alive into a pool of lampreys and consumed by these fierce creatures. Now, what was essentially going on in Seneca's analysis was that Vedius Pollio believed in a world in which glasses simply don't get broken. Seneca thought that the problem with rich people like Vedius was that their expectations were absurdly high. And that's as true of the rich today. Watch people at a first-class airline check-in desk, and you realize that people tend to shout more there than at the economy class counter. The wealthier you are, the more expectations you tend to have. And it's when expectations are dashed that fury breaks out. The rich believe their money will insulate them from setbacks and frustrations, and that's one of the absurdest expectations of all. Seneca's philosophy isn't only relevant to those of us who lose our tempers. He thought we all react badly to frustration, and so can all benefit from lowered expectations. I'm hopeless in the morning. I set my alarm and then I endlessly keep pressing the snooze button. I've only got like 10 minutes to get up. So then I rush along and down at the bus stop, usually kind of twitching, waiting for the bus to come along, because it never comes along, of course it never comes along when you want to. Usually once I'm on the bus, I can relax to a certain extent, though there is always the traffic problem. And I'll sit there and probably read a manuscript. And then finally get into work and open my emails, look at the sales figures, and look at my diary, think, well, oh, oh my God, God, I've got to do this, or I've got to do that. That's how the day starts. Rip it. Well, what kind of fiction planning meeting? Phoenicia Butterfield is the marketing manager for a publishing company. She finds the stress of her job difficult to cope with. I wondered whether Seneca might help her too. Okay, bye. What's your average day like here? Um, quite hectic, lots of meetings. Publishers tend to be kind of quite verbose. Authors phone up and they'll suddenly say, is this happening? And then you'll have to check up to see whether it is or not. And what kind of things stress you out most? Meetings that drag on. 
Yeah. Like someone will say, can we have a really quick meeting and it'll only be half an hour and then you're sitting there kind of twitching because it's taken an hour and a half and you're thinking of all the things you've got to do. And um, What do you do when you get particularly stressed? You know, when your, your desk is overflowing with papers yes, as it I seems know. to be now. What do, you, <laughs> what do you actually do to kind of... Um, what do I do? Um, I run around and um, get bossy. God. Um, there could be one solution to all this. What, there might be one solution. This, what could the solution be? <laughs> well, our friend Seneca, yeah. um, he had this one idea that he says that what makes us most stressed mm. out is things that take us by surprise. Mm. That most, most stressed, most angry yeah. um, if a kind of problem looms up that you haven't expected. Mm. So if you've told yourself, okay, things probably will go wrong, the art department probably won't get the thing, you know, mm. my assistant will, will be late, etc., etc., yeah. when these things happen, um, you're kind of prepared for them. And he said, you know, the greatest mm. thing, the greatest way to combat anger and frustration is to be prepared. Um, and that's why he advised this kind of premeditation. But then you might also kind of stress your, out, yourself out even more by imagining all the terrible things that could happen. So before you even get there, you're kind of panicking, thinking, oh, my God, this could sure. happen. Sure. With well, my initial reaction is to kind of think, well, no, it's going to be fine. It's going to be OK. Yeah. So you calmly prepared yourself and not in a sort of you know, manic way, but yeah. just if you've just said to yourself, OK, things. We usually go, try to reassure yeah, people by saying things like, don't worry, it'll be fine. But Seneca believed such cosy advice to be potentially very cruel, because it leaves us unprepared if things turn out not to be OK. So he recommended an opposite strategy, a calm, daily meditation on all the things that might go wrong. And I think what he was trying to do was simply get us to structure those thoughts, which we sometimes have, so that we'd actually do them every morning. So you do it every morning. So you do it every morning. I mean, is that something you'd like to try, maybe? Okay. Give it a try. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to be late for work because um, I'll get to the bus stop and I'll wait some time for the bus and it will finally come. And then what will happen is that the bus driver will be in a bit of a hurry. So he'll slam the brakes down and he'll probably crash into somebody. And so then I'll be late for work and then I'll be late for a meeting, um, which starts at nine. And I'll walk in and um, 20 people will kind of turn around and go, as I kind of predicted, the bus didn't have a crash, but it was really, really late, so I was late, and everyone did kind of go. But um, luckily, everyone wasn't too depressed, and I didn't get any more work out of it. And I've got a doctor's appointment, I'm just a check up, but they'll probably say that I've got terminal brain cancer or something like that. Hi, um, I'm a bit late because um, I overslept, which is really annoying, so I was planning to get in early. Um, and um, write a presentation for an author. So that's kind of scuppered that plan. Um, I've got a cold, so it'll probably develop into pneumonia or something. And um, I've got a meeting with UIP, which is a film distributor, about a film tie that we're doing. And they'll probably demand loads of money from us, which we don't have, and we'll end up having an argument. Um, well, I thought I'd kind of sum up my week of being deeply pessimistic every day. Um, I think in a way it can be useful. It probably makes you prepare a bit more and realise that you're rushing around a little too much and everything's a little bit too last minute. And it makes you be aware probably of the things that you can affect in your life and the things that you can't. And the things that you can't affect like the bus or like other people not doing their jobs or other people um, screwing up or not living on time. It makes you perhaps more um, philosophical about those kind of things. Of course, Seneca wouldn't suggest to Venetia that she shouldn't ever expect things to go to plan. He would just ask her to be psychologically prepared for a day when they didn't. Seneca believed that we actually frequently overestimate our capacity to change what is occurring, to change a frustrating situation. And it was in order to remind us constantly of just how many things lie outside of our control that he invoked a goddess. Her name was Fortune. She was to be found represented on the back of many Roman coins, and there were also statues of her throughout Italy. She was represented holding two objects. In one hand, she was holding a cornucopia, a symbol of her power to bestow favours. She held in this cornucopia many of the best things in life. But Fortune also held another object, a far darker object, a rudder, which was a symbol of her power to shift our destinies for the worst. 
If she was feeling fiendish, and she frequently was, she could, just at the touch of the rudder, destroy our lives, destroy our jobs. She could cause untold headaches for us. She is a symbol of everything that we must accept, both good things, but also bad things, that when things go wrong, we shouldn't rant and shout. We should remember that many of our frustrations are in fact the work of this fiendish goddess, whose actions we cannot change. Most of the inhabitants of Pompeii, a small town on the foothills of Mount Vesuvius, believed themselves to be the masters of their own destiny. But there's perhaps no starker reminder of what lies outside our control than the forces of nature. At midday on August 13th, AD 79, they were to discover that fortune had plans of her own for them. Within hours, Pompeii was buried beneath scalding volcanic ash. It was a horribly graphic illustration of Seneca's point, that we are never immune from fortune. Even when things look safe, they may rapidly take a disastrous turn for the worse. And the best way to protect ourselves is to be psychologically prepared. We tend to think that the most important thing about philosophers is the books they've written, that this is where all the consolation and wisdom must lie. But the ancients held to the far richer idea that we should also be guided in moments of trouble by the way philosophers actually lived and died. And it's the moment of Seneca's death which has most inspired people ever since. It's been endlessly depicted throughout the centuries in art, literature and music. In April 65 AD, there was a conspiracy against the Emperor Nero in which Seneca was implicated, though he was probably innocent. Nero sent a centurion to Seneca's villa to command him to kill himself immediately. When his family and friends heard the news, they broke down in tears. But Seneca did not. And his attitude to this disaster has helped to define what we mean when we say that we should take something philosophically. He calmly took a knife and began slitting his veins. Seneca died in the way he urged us all to live. As he had reminded a friend on the loss of her son, what need is there to weep over parts of life? The whole of it calls for tears. With any luck, nothing so terrible will happen to us. But bad things can happen, and the best way to soften the blows, if they come, is to be prepared. Anger and frustration are essentially irrational responses to setbacks, and the only rational strategy is to stay calm about the fact that things do go wrong. That way will be, in the truest and best sense of the word, philosophical. <laughs>